Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Gaffer and Gear and yes, it's another gear review. Today we're gonna to look at the Aperture 300X. Now this is not a cob light, this is actually a bicolor hard light source that can give you very, very crisp shadows. It has a Bowens mount on the front for dishes, softbox accessories, and even optical accessories. So let's see what it can do. Now in this video, I'm not gonna do a thorough walkthrough of the uh, 300X unit here like I normally do in my reviews. And the reason is I've already reviewed the 300D Mark II and the two lights are extremely similar with their build quality and their menu system in terms of ease of operation. So if you wanna cover all that stuff, I've got a link in the description below to the 300D Mark II review. That is well worth a watch. Also in that review, we cover the, um, the Fresnel 2X attachment in detail. So if you wanna find out more about this, also go to that review. And in the description of that review, there's a time index, so you can just skip to the parts that interest you. All right, so let's go over the differences between this and the 300D Mark II. Well, the first noticeable, noticeable difference is the light emitters. So on the 300D Mark II, you've got a COB, which is basically hundreds of micro LEDs, and then a big lump of phosphor over the front. And that phosphor glows and reacts to the light coming off the LEDs and gives you a tremendous amount of light power. Now, with this unit, we've got two arrays of LEDs. You've got warm white emitters and daylight emitters all squeezed in together and then they're put under this lens on the front to try and get it to one light source, to one singular shadow point. Now the sacrifice there, of course, is brightness. So this unit comes in at about 52% the brightness of the 300D Mark II. So you do sacrifice brightness to get your bicolor. One thing I really like that Aperture's done here is the decision to use the same head leads and the same power leads as the 300D Mark II. So there's less bits and pieces to keep track of or to keep in separate kits. Now, if you do plug the wrong head into the wrong controller, you're not gonna blow anything up. You just get a notification saying that you've plugged in the wrong fixture. Now, in terms of identifying the two fixtures, there's enough visual differences between the two that chances are you're not gonna get it mixed up anyway. So the 300D Mark II has a red stripe through here where this has carbon fiber and the control box has carbon fiber on the top. Furthermore, the control box has a second uh, rotary wheel, <laughs> rotary wheel, which selects your Kelvin. So you can select your Kelvin in 50 Kelvin increments, and your Kelvin range is six and a half thousand Kelvin right down to 2,700 Kelvin. And in the center of the wheel is a preset button. So you can quickly jump to common Kelvins. So you've got 2,700 Kelvin, 3,200 Kelvin, 4,300 Kelvin, uh, 5,500 Kelvin and 6,500 Kelvin. Now the next main difference in the light is in the effects menu. With a lot of the effects, you can now select a CCT. And furthermore, you've got the additional effect fire. Now the only other difference really is in the menu system. The first option in the menu is output mode. And when you select output mode, you've got a choice of constant output or maximum output. So let me explain what this does. So you've got two sets of light emitters. You've got your warm white and you've got your cool white. And as you fade between the two, that selects your Kelvin. Now, if you have the thing set to constant output, as you fade between the two, adjusting your Kelvin, your light level stays the same. Now, the next difference with the light is the power draw. So the 300D Mark II, pulled about 320 watts off AC power. This unit varies a little bit depending on what Kelvin you're running it at and whether the unit is running in maximum output mode. So in tungsten or 3200 Kelvin, this unit pulls 231 watt and in daylight 5600 Kelvin, it was pulling 238 watt. All right, so now let's get into negatives, things I don't like about the light. And this really shows that Aperture pay attention to user feedback because there's only one thing I don't like about this light. And that is it doesn't have an external DC inlet. So if you wanna power this unit, you are limited to V-mount batteries or powering it via the AC inlet. You can't run it off a block battery, for example. Now, in terms of running it off V-mount batteries, 
My largest capacity batteries are 290 watt hour. And running this thing at 5,600 Kelvin, at 100% brightness in a maximum output mode, I got one hour and 56 minutes of continuous runtime. Now let's talk about improvements since I reviewed the 300D Mark II. And the most notable is the reflector. The reflector no longer rattles and the barn doors won't fall off the front. Now, the next impressive improvement on the light is the dimmer. Check this out. It is incredibly smooth. Now, this is being operated manually. Now, it doesn't matter if you're running this thing uh, manually like I am now, or running it off the phone app, or even running it off DMX. It is incredibly smooth. All right, so let's get into the nuts and bolts of what I found during my testing. Now, the number one question a lot of gaffers will want to know is can this bicolor unit actually deliver crisp, hard shadows the same way as the monocolor unit could? Now, my answer to that is 95% of the time, yes. So let me explain what I found. If you have something that casts shadows and it, was, it is within the first 50 centimeters of the light, so in this range here, it will cast multiple shadows. Now from 50 centimeters to about a meter, you will get singular shadows, but I wouldn't call them crisp. They would be about as sharp as the best Fresnel that you've uh, probably used. So they'll have a little bit of double shadow, but on a par with a really, really good Fresnel. Now when you get past one meter, the shadows off this are razor sharp, unbelievably razor sharp. So if I put my hand 20 centimeters out from the light, and then move it to one meter away, you can see that we go from multiple shadows to a very, very sharp singular light source. Now it's worth pointing out at this stage, I'm talking about using it with no modifier on. We're talking about the raw light itself. Now you might be thinking, well, that's okay. I'm not gonna be using the light within 50 centimeters of my subject. So I'm not gonna have a problem with multiple shadows. Well, here's something you're forgetting. There is something that we use in this range to create shadows, and that is the barn doors. Now this is a bit of a boner for me because I really love using these barn doors with my monocob lights. Um, every monocob light I have has its own set of barn doors. I love the fact that I get um, one light source, one singular shadow, and I can barn door cut it. So that does create a problem. We do get some multiple shadowing off the barn doors, but it depends on how you use the barn doors. Like I said earlier, you're gonna get hard, super crisp shadows 95% of the time that you use this thing. So here's the thing. If you have a small slash like that, then you do get a little bit of multiple shadowing on the edges. It is very hard to notice, and I would say, to give you a comparison, that it is better than you'd get out of a HMI Fresnel. But if you do a really tight slit, then the barn doors start acting like a pinhole camera and project the texture of the lens. Now, in this photo of my dog, you can definitely see the texture that I'm talking about in the light slash. Now, this isn't a criticism of the barn doors or of the light, it's just something to be aware of when you're using this tool. Now in this photo here, the base of the vase is about 70 centimeters away from the light. So as you can see, it's definitely a singular light source. And even the refractions through the water are what you would expect from a singular light source. In this photo, the light is just over one meter away from the wall. And as you can see, it's very, very hard singular point shadows. Now, in both of these photos, the light was set to 4,400 Kelvin. So it was using a mix of daylight and warm white emitters. Now, as I said earlier, when you get past one meter away from the light, you get super fine, razor sharp shadows. Now, to illustrate this, I got a half stop wire and put it up against a piece of paper and then put the light exactly one meter away from the wire. Now, as a further test, I also took photos at different Kelvins. What I was curious to see is if you had the daylight emitters or the warm white emitters or a mixture of both working, would that affect the shadow qualities? Now, let's have a look at the shadows at the different color temperatures. This is at 2700 Kelvin. This is at 3200 Kelvin. This is at 4,300 Kelvin, 
5,500 Kelvin and 6,500 Kelvin. Now further to this, the light targets a very accurate CCT value. In fact, if you dial in a CCT, it is typically out by plus or minus 29 Kelvin, which is incredibly accurate. And further to this, the engineers have gone to a lot of effort to make sure that our commonly used Kelvins, that's 5,600 Kelvin and 3,200 Kelvin, are very close to the Planckian curve, which means they have no color hue. In fact, when I took a reading of this unit at 3,200 Kelvin, its delta UV score was zero, which means it's sitting smack on the Planckian curve. Now, what that means is that if I go to mix this light at 3,200 Kelvin with actual tungsten lights, it'll blend in beautifully. It won't have any color hues. Now with this light running raw or with the barn doors, it does have some different characteristics to a COB light. However, when you run it with the reflector or the uh, Fresnel 2X, it runs pretty much the same. Okay, so let's talk about some brightness levels. Um, so I did some testing at 3200 Kelvin, which is tungsten and did some measurements at three meters. Now to give us a yardstick, something to compare with, I also took some measurements off some tungsten lights. So I used a 1K, which came in at 1,110 lux. And for giggles, I also used a Studio 2K, which came in at 2,460 lux. Now with no modifier on it, the 300X came in at 619 lux. However, when I put the reflector on, that jumped to 1,280 lux. Now, if you compare that to the results with the 1K, you can see that this is legitimately a 1K tungsten equivalent. Now, I can say that in all fairness because both lights have the same beam angle. Now, when I took the um, reflector off and I put on the Fresnel 2X, it jumped to 2,490 lux. Now, if you compare that to the 2K Fresnel, you can see that the results are very similar. So this is sort of comparable with a 2K tungsten Fresnel. Now, what I mean by sort of comparable is the 2K tungsten Fresnel has a wider beam angle. It goes out to about 58 degrees, whereas this only goes out to 40 degrees, and the 2K Fresnel does barn door cut way better than this unit can. In fact, this is the finest barn door cut you can get with the 2X Fresnel attachment. So it's not gonna replace a 2K tungsten anytime soon, but it gives you a clear indication of the firepower you can get out of it. Okay, now let's have a look at the daylight level. So that's at 5,600 Kelvin. All right, so with no modifier on the front, it came in at 726 lux. With the reflector on, it came in at 1,560 lux. And with the Fresnel 2X on the front, it jumped to, to 3,010 lux. Now, 3,010 lux makes it about the equivalent of a 400 watt HMI Fresnel. Now, overall, with all of the modifiers and without the modifiers, this unit comes in at about 52% the brightness of the 300D Mark II. Now, let's get into talking about the 300X on the spotlight mount. And this is the, um, the part of the review that I was most excited to do my testing for. This is really what I was interested in. Can we get a bicolor light engine onto an ellipsoidal and get really fine optics? And the answer is yes, you get some really, really good optics. Now there are some uh, characteristics in this that are different to the 300D. So we'll do a, a bit of a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison, have a look at those things. And um, the thing that I was most interested in and most disappointed with, with this light is how it compares brightness-wise to a tungsten ellipsoidal. So uh, in a shootout with uh, my Celicon zoom spots, which are 800 watt tungsten ellipsoidals with matching beam angles, that's 36 degree beam angles, the Celicon zoom spot comes in at 2.8 times brighter than one of these. So this came in at 1,740 lux and the uh, tungsten ellipsoidal came in at 4,970 lux. And I think the large part of that brightness difference is the fact that the tungsten ellipsoidal has its globe sitting inside a glass parabolic. And I think that makes a huge amount of difference. But in pretty much every other way, optics, uh, control, uh, in terms of you know, Wi-Fi, uh, or sorry, Bluetooth app control, and DMX control, um, in all other ways, this does destroy the, um, destroy the tungsten ellipsoidals. But it's just a shame it didn't have the brightness output. Anyway, let's have a look.
All right, so here's what I found doing a day of testing uh, with this, um, with the 300X versus the 300D mounted. Now, with the 300X, this does have some slightly different characteristics. So what I found was um, with certain patterns, the 300X would be sharper than the 300D. But with other patterns, the 300D would be sharper than the 300X. So let's go through my findings here. And just so I didn't get confused with the photos, uh, all the photos of the patterns that are daylight balanced or, or white, they're done with the 300D. All of the patterns that are amber are done with the 300X. Now the only reason I did that is so I wouldn't mix the photos up when I'm doing my post-production. So on complex random patterns, the 300X was sharper than the 300D. Now also with circular patterns, the 300X was sharper than the 300D. Now when it comes to non-complex straight line patterns, they're both pretty much the same. So even a non-complex window like this, both lights are pretty much identical. However, when it comes to patterns that have fine linear lines, the 300D is sharper than the 300X. Now I found those characteristics to be quite interesting and it was the same across all of the gobos I tested. And I put it down to having something to do with the lens that's in here to mix all the LEDs together. Now there is one other characteristic of the 300X that you need to be aware of when using it with the spotlight mount. And it's not a fault, it's just something to be aware of when you're using this tool. And that is when you have a very defocused image, you can have a texture. So as you can see on this pattern here, the texture looks like some painted lines. Whereas on the 300D, there is no texture at all. Now again, this isn't a fault, it's just something to be aware of. And something I'd just like to point out here is with other LED lights, when I defocus them this much, sometimes you can actually see the LED emitters. So it's not too bad overall. Now the last thing we'll talk about before uh, getting into the technical review is uh, how this thing runs off DMX. Now it runs off cable DMX, it doesn't have built-in lumen radio. Um, now this is version one of the firmware, so I don't want to get too critical on the DMX. Uh, Aperture uh, working on improvements to the DMX at the moment for version two of the firmware. Now what I mean by improvements, uh, the current DMX that's in this runs really, really smooth. It, it's beautiful. It's just some simple things need tweaking, like for example, you can't keypad lock it. So if I'm um, standing next to the DOP running the set off Lumen Radio, and one of my best boys is moving the lights around, what quite often happens is they accidentally rub the, um, the controller and change the DMX channel. So simple things like that. Another thing they're working on is um, putting some information on the, on the display here to tell you what the Kelvin is. So if you're using a, a simple DMX desk, you can then um, you know, put some tape down and, and mark your Kelvin points, you know, cross-referring to the screen. So just little things like that. There's nothing, um, there's nothing actually wrong with the DMX. The DMX is really quite good. All right, so enough talk, let's get into it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the room to black and then I'm gonna do a five second fade up from black um, with the unit here. And you won't believe how smooth this comes up from black, from nothing. It's um, one of the smoothest fade ups I've, I've seen on an LED light running off DMX, off any brand. And to be quite honest with you, I can't think of off the top of my head of anything that actually comes up smoothest. Okay, so I'm setting the room to black, uh, programming a five second uh, fade up. And in three, two, one, how smooth is that? Okay, now if you're impressed with the fade up, watch the fade down. Okay, so fading down, five second fade to black. And five second fade up. So very, very impressive. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna do a five second uh, CCT sweep. So I'm going to go from the base Kelvin, which it's in now, which is uh, 2,700 Kelvin. I'm going to do a sweep up to 6,500 Kelvin in three, two, one, start. Okay, so you can see how smoothly it transitions its CCTs. And it's worth noting in here that um, the unit is in its constant output mode, so the exposure is not changing. Okay, now I'm going to sweep back the other way in three, two, one, sweep. 
So very, very smooth. No jerkiness uh, at all in there. Very, very smooth. Uh, now, the next thing I want to show you is a limitation of the DMX uh, with this unit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hard switch uh, the Kelvins. So it doesn't do a smooth hard switch on its Kelvins. Okay, so that's uh, worth noting. However, if you do even the, uh, the smallest uh, timed uh, transition, um, it does that smooth. Very, very smooth. But it can't do a hard switch all that well. Um, so that's not something I'd, I'd typically use much anyway. Uh, now the next thing I want to show is uh, it's on off. So um, this is its instant on off commands over DMX. So it doesn't go instantly, um, instantly up. There's a very, very slight uh, delay as it ramps up real quick. But it's, it's pretty smooth. Now one thing I do like um, with lights that don't do um, instant fade ups is quite often I'm working with people who don't have a lot of money. So they don't have cameras uh, with global shutters. So um, sometimes a, a fade up like this where it's a very quick ramp up, not a switch on, um, you don't get uh, any sort of uh, flickering in the frame. So um, anyway, that's the DMX. It's pretty impressive, um, especially for the price. I, I can't think of anything else that's that's got um, sweet working DMX um, in, at you know, as sweet as this at this price point. All right, so let's start going through all the technical data that I've collected for the review. Okay, let's start off with our warm white. So that's uh, anything 2,700 Kelvin up to 4,000 Kelvin. So the, um, the typical uh, CCT accuracy is plus or minus 40 Kelvin. So that means when you dial in a color temperature, you're gonna be typically out by plus or minus 40 Kelvin. That's pretty good. Now the average TLC I score is a very healthy 97.9 and the average TM30 color vector score is a uh, 93.9, which is very good. Now in our mid whites, which is 4,000 to 5,000 Kelvin, the CCT accuracy is mind blowingly accurate. Um, it is typically out by only plus or minus 20 Kelvin on average. The um, TM30, uh, sorry, the TLCI scores, um, average 98.2 and the TM30 average is a 93, which is very, very good. Now in our cool whites, that's 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin, the average, uh, t the average CCT accuracy is plus or minus 27 Kelvin, the average TLCI score is 98 and the average TM30 color vector test score is a very healthy 93.5. Now let's take a look at our commonly used Kelvins. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,176 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 98. And with the individual scores, R12 was below 90 and R9 was the only other individual score below 95%. Color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 94% color render with 100% saturation. And here is the wavelength analysis. And the white point is smack on the Planckian curve with a DUV score of 0 0.0000. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got a very close 4,399 with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 96.2 and only R12 was below 90. TM30 color vector testing suggests a more accurate score would be 93% color render with 101% saturation. Here is the wavelength analysis and the delta UV score is minus 0.0047, which indicates the light is slightly pink by roughly about a one quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got a surprisingly close 5,599 with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 96.2 and only R12 was below 90. TM30 color vector testing suggests a more accurate score would be 93% color render with 100% saturation. Here is the wavelength analysis and the delta UV score is minus 0.0012 and in old school terms is off white by about half of a one eighth correction gel. Okay, well, I hope that review gave you uh, plenty of information. Uh, don't forget to click like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next episode of Gaffer and Gear which will not be a gear review. I've had enough of gear reviews for the next month.